William Gladstone served as the Prime Minister of Britain for four years in the 19, later part of the 19th century. He was a committed Christian. And one day he was approached by a college student who was a great admirer. And Gladstone asked this college student, what do you hope to do when you graduate from college? The young man responded by saying, I hope to attend law school, sir, just as you did. To which Gladstone responded by saying, that is a noble goal. But what then? He says, well, I I hope to practice law and make a good name for myself, defending the poor and the outcast of society just as you did. Again, Gladstone responded by saying, that's a noble purpose, but then what? Well, then the young man said, well, I hope to be able to serve in parliament with great distinction, um, evidencing integrity and, and a concern for justice, just as you did. And again, Gladstone said, that's a noble hope, but then what? Now, this young guy was ambitious. He said, well, I would hope to serve the government as prime minister with the same vigor, dedication, vision, and and integrity as you did. And again, Gladstone responded by saying, okay, then what? The young man said, well, I would hope to then retire with honors and write my memoirs, even as you are presently doing, so that, that others could learn from my mistakes as well as my triumphs. And again, Gladstone said, all of that is very noble, but then what? And the young man thought for a minute and said, well, I guess I would die. And Gladstone said, that's correct. And then what? The young man looked puzzled. And he said, well, sir, I've never given that any thought. And this was Gladstone's response. He said, young man, the only advice I have for you is go home and read your Bible, and think about eternity. It's good advice. Today we are continuing our series, What's Next, where we have been sort of doing a deep dive into Revelation chapters 19 through 21, where we have been looking at what's next for this world. What's next for the followers of Jesus Christ? And the answer is eternity. And eternity is a long time. Now, so far in this series, we have seen that after the rapture, and the rapture is going to take place um, when when the Lord comes for his church and we are caught up into heaven to meet him. And after the rapture and sometime before the second coming of Christ, we, we read here in Revelation chapter 19 that there is a wedding feast in heaven where we as the bride of Christ are celebrating with Jesus, our groom, there in heaven. At the end of that, in Revelation 19, we saw that then Jesus comes back at his second coming, and we come back with him, and he's going to set up his kingdom here on planet earth, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and we will rule with him here on planet earth. And then at the end of that time, and actually during that time, Jesus restores all things here on this earth. We see Satan is bound during that thousand year period. We learned in our study a couple weeks ago that the animal kingdom will be tamed and people will live longer. It's going to be an incredible time here on planet earth. And then last week we saw that at the end of that millennial reign of Christ, The thing that happens is called the great white throne judgment. And that's where unbelievers from all errors are going to stand before God and be judged. And it's there that Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and all of those who followed him. And so the big question after that, after what we read last week is, 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 okay, what's next? And that, my friends, is what the passage that we're looking at today addresses. A new heaven and a new earth. Now, Paul the Apostle wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And when we think about eternity, Paul is right. Like we, it's hard for us to even imagine what God has prepared for us. But then the very next thing that Paul said was, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. 
For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So God has revealed them to us, but I have to say, he's revealed them to us, but not in great detail. And I think there's a reason for that. I think that, that if we knew exactly what God had planned for us in eternity and what eternity was going to look like, we would be so consumed with where we are going that we would be worthless here. It's sort of like my kids when they were younger or my grandkids today. When we would tell them that, hey, in a couple weeks, we're going to go somewhere really, really special, it's all they could think about. Every single day. Is it today? Are we going today? When, when is it? You know, when, when is it going to happen? And, and I tell them, no, no, it's not today. Go, go play. Go do your chores. You know, we'll let you know when, when the day comes. And every single day, you know, almost every hour, is it time yet, Bobby? Are we going? And at least that, that's how my kids were and my grandkids are. Yours might be better, but that's how mine were. And I think if we really knew what was coming, that's the way that we would be. And so I think God keeps it a little bit vague because he knows we wouldn't be able to handle it. Well, here in the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, God gives us a glimpse of what our forever is going to look like and here in chapter 21, in the first part of chapter 22, he's talking about our eternal home. And I'll break it up today in this way. We're going to see that there's a new creation, there's a new communion, and number three, there's a new community. We'll begin with the new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. Look at verse one again. He says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and also there was no more sea. Now all the surfers and ocean enthusiasts just panicked right now. They're like, what? No more sea? It's gonna be okay. I'll get back to that in just a few minutes for all of you ocean enthusiasts like myself. But I want to begin by pointing out that there are two words that the Bible uses for new. One is the word neos, and neos means new chronologically, like, like a new time or a new day. For example, today is a new day. Yesterday was the 12th, today is the 13th, but it's, it's a new day but the same surroundings. That's neos. It's new chronologically. But then there's a word that is the word kainos, and it means new in the sense that it's completely difference. Kainos is the word that's used here. It's completely different. In other words, we're talking about a brand new design, that this is like nothing we have ever seen before. You know, our God is an artist, and we're reminded of that every single day when we view a beautiful sunset, or we go somewhere where maybe we see some rare exotic plant that we've never seen before. Or we go somewhere where we get to go snorkeling and we see all of the fish life and exotic fishes under the water. All of that reminds us that our God is an artist. And after the millennium, God is going to create something that is unlike anything that we have ever seen before. In fact, I love the way Isaiah the prophet puts it in Isaiah 65. He says, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And then get this, he says, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Isn't that an incredible statement? That he's saying what God is going to create is going to be so amazing and so incredible that, that the former, this earth, isn't even going to come to mind. We're not even going to remember it. We're going to look back panning or pining for it at all because of what's coming is going to be so much more incredible. God has an endless capacity for creating and so everything is ever and always new. I love that joke about the scientist who looked, looked up into heaven one day and smugly said, God, you must feel a little bit outdated now that, that we scientists can do everything that you do and we can keep the universe running without you. And God said, oh, really? And so he issued a 
issued a, a challenge to that scientist. And so God reached down and he took a handful of dirt and he blew on it and out flew a flock of beautiful and exotic birds. And the scientist thought, oh, no problem. Our modern technology, we've mastered the principles of soil manipulation and genetics. And so he reached down and he grabbed a handful of dirt and God said, wait, 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 wait a second. Get your own dirt. <laughs> And it's true. The Bible says that God created this world out of nothing. And when he creates the new heaven and the new earth, he's going to use new elements that will be entirely different. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says that God will fold up the heavens and the earth like a cloak. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said that the heaven and the earth will pass away. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he told us that the elements will burn up like a fervent heat. So our eternal home is going to start with a new creation. The Lord is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, Pastor Rob, but what about the no see part? Well, a few ideas here. The world that we live in right now is watery. Three quarters of the earth is made up of water. Three quarters of the earth's surface, 75% is ocean. And do you know that your body is mostly water? 90% of your blood is water. 65% of your flesh is water. If you don't drink enough water, you'll die. And so I think one of the things that John might be saying here is that when he says there's no more sea is that the makeup of this new earth is going to be designed incredibly different from this one. The new world will not operate on this system any longer. It won't be a water-based system, in other words. We'll have completely new bodies in new conditions in this new world. Life on earth, in this new earth, will be completely different from what we know now. Another thing about the seas is that seas divide people. Oceans divide people. Our continents are divided by oceans. And so when John is saying, hey, there won't be any sea, he, I think what he's saying is there won't be any separation. That there's going to be a greater unity that we will have continuous access to everyone. But I want you to note this, you water enthusiasts like myself. It doesn't say that there will be no water. There'll be bodies of water. There'll be lakes. There'll, there'll be bodies of water. But our world is not going to be separated the way that it is now by oceans. And I want all of those who are surfers to take courage because the God who spoke this world into existence, if he wants there to be surfing in the new world, I'll tell you what, he can create waves. In fact, if he wants there to be surfing in the new world, there will be perfect waves all the time. I mean, it's like the perfect swell every single day. Now, here's the thing though. I don't know personally if we're even going to be interested in those things. These perfect conditions. You know, sometimes I hear people saying, you know, I hope there's golf in heaven. And I, and, and I think, you know, I like to golf, but, but I, I think in, in, in the new world, I think it would be kind of boring because you're perfect. And so it's like a hole in one every single time. <laughs> Like, how fun would that be? Like that, I, I think what God has in store for us is so beyond and so much better. We're not going to miss anything, anything here on planet Earth. So hopefully that comforts all of you Earth, <laughs> Earth lovers there. Now, some people wonder, though, why a new heaven? New heaven, new earth. Why a new heaven? Well, in Job 15, verse 15, it says, the heavens are not clean in God's sight. And many Bible scholars would suggest that the current heaven was marred by Satan's rebellion. 
Remember, Satan was an angel who rebelled. He sought to uh, put himself above God. And so Satan and a bunch of his followers, a third of the angels, were thrust out of heaven. And right now, the Bible says that God still has access to heaven. In fact, he will have access to heaven. He comes into heaven as the accuser of the brethren. And that takes place until we see in Revelation chapter 20 that he is finally put into the lake of fire forever. So God, some have suggested, is going to make a new heaven so there's no more memory or byproduct of how the first one was marred. I don't know if that's true, but I think it's interesting to consider. But I think the first thing that that John is wanting us to to get a hold of here is that this new world that God has for us, it's a new creation. It's a new design. Number two... It's a new communion. Look at verse two. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Here we see that the focal point of this new earth is the capital city, the new Jerusalem. And John says that he saw it coming down out of heaven, this city that had been prepared by God. And the fact that it comes down and that it is prepared would mean that it already exists. That it's already been planned and prepared by God. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? When he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you. And every time I read that verse, I I think of the reality that God spoke this world into existence in six days. And Jesus made that statement over 2,000 years ago. So we could say that God has been working, preparing our heavenly home, the the, the new Jerusalem, for over 2,000 years. Now this city has an interesting description given here by John. He says it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What does that mean? I think what he's saying is the new city is described as a bride because it takes the character of its occupants. It's because of the life who's living there, the bride, the church. It takes the character of the occupants. In the same way, my house where I live, to anyone who knows us, is not known as an address. No, anybody drives by, anybody but comes over, it's like, hey, that's the Salvado house. We're going to the Salvado house because that's where we live. It takes the character of those who live there. When my grandkids say, you know, they, they call it, it's Mimi and Poppy's house. That, that's where we're going today, to Mimi and Poppy's house. And in a similar way, the new Jerusalem is going to be characterized by the bride, the city of the bride. You know, cities today get nicknames. Let's see how you are with nicknames. What's the, Las Vegas is known as what? Sin City. City. Chicago is known as? The Windy City. LA is known as the City of Champions. Uh, (laughs) Nashville is known as what? Music City. Well, the new Jerusalem is going to be known as Bridesville. It's going to be, it's going to be the, the, the bride city because the church is there, because we are there, and we're going to be there with Jesus. It's pure, it's gleaming, it's bright, it's beautiful, it's graceful, it's breathtaking. And you know, marriage is supposed to be the closest possible relationship that we can experience here on earth. It speaks of, the marriage relationship speaks of an intimate relationship. And in this city, the new Jerusalem, there's an intimacy about this city because of the inhabitants' relationship with God. In fact, look at verse three. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. There's an intimacy there in this city. There's no separation. Right now, we can have a relationship with God, but, but, but there's a separation. He's in heaven, we're here on earth. The Bible says right now, we see things dimly. It's not clear. 
But there's a day coming when, when we're going to see things clearly, that we're going to be with him. We're going to see him face to face. And the Bible says that in his presence is fullness of joy. And, and John is saying God is going to be with us, and he's going to be there in that city, and we are going to be with him. We're going to experience the fullness of God. We only get a glimpse of that here. In fact, notice verse 22, skip down to there. It says, and I saw that there was no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In Bible times, in the city of Jerusalem, there was always a temple and that was the place where people would go to meet with God and worship God. But, but the, the normal person was always on the outskirts because only the high priest could go into that inner chamber of the temple, that inner room where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. And the high priest could only do that on one day out of the year, the Day of Atonement. So the whole relationship, the whole system that was set up spoke of, of a distance. Now when Jesus came, remember the veil was ripped in two and it was God's way of saying, you know, that anyone can come now boldly into my presence and, and we can do that. We did that today, you know, in worship as we're entering into his presence. We do that as we come before him in, in prayer, but, but there's still a distance because we're not seeing him face to face. In this new Jerusalem, there's no temple there's no churches, there's no cathedrals, because Jesus and God are ever present with, with their people. And we see him, that we're with him face to face. We could say that in essence, heaven comes down and heaven and earth and the new Jerusalem, they intersect. You know, Jesus described eternal life in John chapter 17, three, verse three, and he says, and this is eternal life, that you may know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. And the word that he uses there for know is the word gnosko in the Greek. And it means to know in an intimate relationship. You see, there are some people who know about God. There are some people who know about Jesus. But they don't know him. Not in an intimate way. Jesus says eternal life is, is knowing him. It's entering into that relationship with him. And if you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to do that. But eternal life also doesn't speak of a, just a longevity of life. It is that. But it speaks of a quality of life. A quality of life that starts right now. The moment that a person opens up their heart to Jesus Christ. But that relationship that we can have, that we can know him and we sense him and we commune with him. It's still just a fraction, a touch of what it's going to be. And the ultimate is we're going to see him face to face. And we are going to be with him forever. And we're going to be able to, to touch him and hug him and be with him. In the new Jerusalem, we can experience this new communion with God. And so there's a new communion. There's a new creation. And finally, number three, there's a new community. And you know, sometimes the best way to describe something new is to contrast it with something else. And that's what John does here. He's going to contrast the life in the new world with the, the life in this world by describing what's missing. And so notice in the new world, the new Jerusalem, he tells us there's no more tears. Look at verse four. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. No more tears. There will not be a use for Kleenex. The Kleenex company will go out of business. There will be no crying in the new community. There's no death. You know, death scars life. It scars human existence, but not in the new city. Not in the new community. There, there's no death. There's, there's no funeral services. There's no cemeteries. There's no funerals. There, there's no gut-wrenching goodbyes. And not only that, there will be no fear of death. I was talking to a guy this past week in our church who was having some physical issues. And we were talking. And he said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid of dying. I know where I'm going. But he said, 
you know, the thing I'm, I, I do have, I'm f- fearful of is that my wife is going to be taken care of. And, and I know a lot of you, you share that same sentiment, that same fear. Not in the new community. It's not a fear. It's not an issue. You know, the fear of every single parent is that something might happen to one of their children and their children would die. Some of you have experienced that. We've walked through you with that. It's a heartbreaking thing that you've gone through, gone through. not in the new community or in the new Jerusalem. There's no death. There's no sorrow. There's no sadness. No depression. There's no pain. There's no heartache. Notice in verse four it says, there shall be no pain for the former things have passed away. There's no pain. There's no pain from past hurts. No pain, no gain will not be a concept in the new community. There's no relational pain. I think probably most of us have have experienced a relationship that has become broken for some reason. There's a break of trust or something has happened and and it's left us that every time that person's name is brought up or any time that we maybe see them or a picture of them, there's a pain that fills our heart. Not in the new community. In verse five, we're said, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things all that, that, that divides us, causes us pain, is going to be put away. The former things are going to be put away. Another thing there won't be is there won't be any thirst. Notice the end of verse 5. He said, and he said to me, right, for, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. What he's saying there is, there's going to be not be any thirst because we're going to always forever be refreshed in every single way. Because Jesus is the one who fills the longing in the soul. And lastly, there will be no evil. He says, but the cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Every evil influence that plagues us in this world will not be a part of the new world. None of that will be a part of the new community. And who is this for? Well, he tells us there in verse seven, he says that he who overcomes shall inherit all of these things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Who are the overcomers? The Bible says in 1 John, whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is what has overcome the world. It's our faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what makes us overcomers. So that's what's missing. Now let's consider what's magnificent about this city, our eternal home, the new Jerusalem. And I'll be honest that what John describes in the rest of this chapter is really, really hard to imagine. It's hard to describe. Do you ever like to look at travel brochures? I like to do that sometimes. And it's interesting, there are some places that they just don't have travel brochures for, like, like Barstow, you know, there's just <laughs> nothing against Barstow, but if you're from there, but, you know, they don't make travel brochures for places like that. It's like, it's, you just drive through, you know, basically. <laughs> but what's interesting about travel brochures is they usually look way better than the reality, right? I mean, the pictures are all edited, they're photoshopped. So when you get to that place, the water never looks as blue or as clear. The room is always smaller. The the food, you know, always looks way better in the pictures. But I got to tell you this. Listen to me. In the case of our eternal home, our new world, the new Jerusalem, the opposite is true. The travel brochure that John gives us here doesn't even come close to how incredible this is going to be. How incredible the reality is. And the, pro- the reason is, is because John is limited by our human vocabulary. 
He's limited in describing what he's seeing by, by human words. And they just don't do it justice. And so we really have to use our imaginations. And for that reason, I'm not going to go into great detail about all of this. I just want to make some quick observations about what's magnificent. And we'll start with the glory. Notice verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, now just pause there for a minute. If you're, you're wondering, what is this angel with the seven last bowls doing here with the seven last plagues? That's not what it's saying. It's, it's identifying this is the angel who poured out the seven last plagues. That was his assignment before this. Now he has a new assignment. And I, and I think he's really stoked because that, that was a hard assignment to do that. And this is a great assignment. He gets to describe to John the new Jerusalem and what it's going to be like. So he says, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The word glory is the word kabod. Everybody say kabod. kabod. It means weightiness. And the idea is that the presence of God is so thick in this place. The glory of God is so thick in this place that you can feel it wherever you are. That's the kabod. Now the opposite of the kabod is Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. That's what we experience here on planet Earth. The glory has departed. Wickedness is rampant in our world. And so we're living in Ichabod, and we can get little glimpses here and there of the Kabod. You know, like at that men's conference yesterday, I mean, that, that's a little glimpse. 10,000 guys worshiping the Lord together. That's a little glimpse of the glory. You sense his presence and 10,000 voices of men worshiping and, and celebrating God. But in the new community, the glory of God will be so thick. The glory of God will be prevalent. The glory of God will be like light flashing into all the places. There's going to be a brilliance about it. And so first of all, he describes the glory, and then he describes the structure. Look at verse 12. And also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So this is sort of a general description. It has four sides. It has walls and gates. And verse 25 tells us that the gates never shut. They're always open. And I think the gates being always open indicate that we're going to be coming and going. That there's a world outside of this city that we get to explore. And the angels at the gates are, are not there as guards, I don't think, but they're more as greeters. And as we're coming and going, they're like, hey, where are you going today? Oh, I'm going to explore some galaxy. And they're like, oh, far out, have a great time. You know, that's why they're there. That's what's happening. And notice the 12 gates have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why is that? Because that's a part of our heritage. We're connected, you see, to the God of Israel. That's where it started. We, we, we learned on Wednesday night with the men, God said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to go outside and I want you to look at the stars. What's he doing? He's calling on Abraham to imagine something. Because imagination is a big part of faith. And so he says, hey, I want you to look at the stars, count them. And, and, and I want you to know, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And this is when Abraham didn't have any kids at all. And he was like 75 years old. Count them. This is what I'm going to do for you. 
Your descendants are going to be like the stars in the heavens. And we know that Abraham is not just the father of the Jewish nation, but he's also the father of faith because everyone who puts their faith in Jesus were, were connected to Abraham in that way. It's a part of our heritage. But also, he says that the walls, the foundations of the walls have 12 names. And these are the names of the 12 apostles, obviously Judas most likely being replaced by the apostle Paul. And all of these names remind us of our heritage in the Lord, the foundation that our faith is built upon. The Old Testament points us to Jesus who was going to come, the Messiah who would come and and he would pay the price for our sins. In the New Testament, it's pointing back to what Jesus did when he came and how he established our salvation and who we are in him. All of it, old and new, it's a part of our heritage. But all of those names, the patriarchs as well as the apostles, are also, I think, reminders of the wonderful and infinite grace of God. Because all the men represented on those walls, all of those names, are names of incredibly flawed individuals, just like you and I. And so their names are a reminder to us of the incredible grace of God. And so there we have the structure. And then we, we also have the, the measurements. And this city, it's ginormous. Look at verse 15. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And, and he measured the city with the reed in 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and height are equal. And then he measured its wall, 140 Four cubits, according to the measure of a man, and that is of an angel. So he's telling us here that the the city is laid out as a square. The Greek word for square is tetragon, means it's four-sided. And and the picture really, what he's picturing is a perfect cube. It's probably the best way to describe it. It says he measured the city with a reed, and it was 12,000 furlongs. How, 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 How big is that? How large is that? Well, a furlong is 600 feet. So get this, picture this, imagine this. That means the city, it's 1,500 miles wide, it's 1,500 miles deep, and it's 1,500 miles tall. That means in this city, the new Jerusalem, our our eternal home, the the streets don't just go horizontally, they go vertically, and that means we, I mean, we travel into space, 1,500 miles in every single direction. Those measurements mean that this city would be 2,250,000 square miles, or... 150,000 times the size of London today. Dr. Henry Morris, a scientist from Southern California, said that this city could house, get this, well over 20 billion people if only 25% of the city was given over to residents. Only 25% is given to to residents. It could could house 20 billion people. And get this, and every person would have 75 acres in every single direction. That would be your plots. It's a ginormous city. And then he mentions the colors. And you know, as we look around, we, we see that God loves beauty. And in eternity, he's going to demonstrate his beauty by all of these different colors. And he gives us a a picture here that is meant to just kind of tickle our imagination. Look at verse 15. And he says, and the construction of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. Now think about that. Gold is opaque. It's not clear. It's solid. Not this gold. It's clear, it's transparent. And I think the reason why it's telling us everything's clear is because everything in the New Jerusalem, it's reflective. And so he describes the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. 
The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, chrysolite the, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. Now, now those of you who, who like to study and kind of geek out on this kind of stuff, I encourage you just go in and study all of those colors. It's incredible. And then he says, in the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate, get this, was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. To me, this sounds like every day is going to be like the northern lights. Just incredible reflections of light and beauty reflecting everywhere. And it's just, I mean, it's just, it's hard to imagine. But I want you to think about these gates. This is what's incredible to me. These gates are not made up of a bunch of pearls. These ginormous gates are made up of one big pearl. And how are pearls made? Pearls are, pearls are made inside of the oyster. And what happens is an irritant gets into the oyster and like a piece of sand or something. And so the, the, the oyster, God designed it in a way it secretes this, this fluid that covers the sand or the irritant. And the bigger the irritant, the bigger the pearl is going to be. And so the beauty that comes out of the pearl or out of the oyster, which is the pearl, is a beauty that is born out of pain. And here we're going to have these gates that are these giant pearls in the new Jerusalem. And I think it's to to remind us of the beauty that has come out of the pain of Jesus. That Jesus left heaven and came to this earth. And went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And three days later, rose again from the the, the grave to give life to anyone and everyone who would put their faith in him. And so every time we pass through these gates, it's just a reminder to us of our Savior and his great love for us. And then we come to the illumination, verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated, and the Lamb is its light. Think about that. No sun. There's no need for the sun because the glory of God, the glory of Jesus, is illuminating the place. Remember when Moses in Exodus chapter 33 asked God, Lord, can I see your glory? Remember what God said? No man can see my glory, Moses, and live. No, you can't. You can't see my glory. It would kill you. Not in the new Jerusalem. In fact, look at chapter 22, verse 4. It says, and they shall see his face and his name, his mark, shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they, sh- and they need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. What, what illuminates the city? It's the brightness. It's the glory of God. And then he continues in verse 24 chapter 21 and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it and its gates shall not be shut all at all by day and there will be no night there and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it and there shall by no means enter it Enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's, it's total perfection, it's total glory, it's total brilliance. But you know what the most glorious thing about the city is going to be? It's not, it's not all the colors, it's not the pearly gates. It's going to be that Jesus is there and we get to be with him. That's going to be the most beautiful thing about all of it. Does your heart long, does it long for your eternal home? Does it long for Jesus, to be with Jesus? You know, the Lord invites us every day to spend time with him, 
to be with him. I love what Gary Hamrick said yesterday at the, the conference, and he was challenging young men to, to be men of the word, to put down their gaming and be men of the word. And when he said that, I thought, that's a good word, but that's not just a word for young men, because I know a lot of older men that get waste a lot of time playing games. And I want to encourage you guys, let's be men of the word. Men who morning by morning that we take up our, our, our Savior's invitation to come and meet with him and commune with him and be with him. Every Sunday night, tonight they're not meeting because of the conference yesterday, but our men meet right in that room on the other side of the, they're studying the book of Joshua. Great book. Wednesday night, men, we're getting together here. We're studying about the men of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Join us. Finally, we see the life. Chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve them. It's a city that's marked by life, a river of life, a tree of life. We're told that the river of life flows from the throne of God. And I think this is symbolic of the very life of God flowing throughout that city to all the occupants in it. And this giant river on both sides of it is this enormous tree, the tree of life. What does that remind you of? Eden, right? It takes us back to Eden, back to the beginning, a, a restoration of what was lost when man ate of that forbidden fruit. And of this tree of life, notice it doesn't bear one fruit, it bears 12 fruit in every season. There's variety, there's life, and it bears fruit all the time, always in season. And it says its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now you might read that and say, wait a minute, does that mean there's going to be sickness in, in the new Jerusalem? Be sickness in, in our eternal home? And the answer is no. The Greek word translated healing is literally therapia, from which we get our English word therapy from. So it doesn't mean healing from sickness, but rather the maintaining of health. In fact, the original language implies an exhilaration and an invigoration. I mean, it's going to be like spa day every day. <laughs> Are you excited about your eternal home? And the travel brochure doesn't even do justice. The best is yet to come, my friends. No wonder, no wonder Paul said, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The best is yet to come. I'll close with this. There was a missionary by the name of Samuel Morrison. He served God in Africa for 25 years. After 25 years, he and his wife were finally coming back home to the States they were on a ship that was coming into New York, and on that same ship was President Roosevelt, who had just returned from a two-week hunting expedition in Africa. And when the ship pulled into the port, there were thousands of people there to welcome the president home. A big parade they were throwing for the president coming back from his two-week hunting trip in Africa. And Samuel Morrison looked at that and just got a little bit upset and he thought, I just, I can't believe it. The president's gone for two weeks and he comes home from hunting and there's a parade here and all these people here and we've been gone serving God for 25 years and we come home and there's hardly anybody here to greet us. And his wife nudged him and said, babe, we're not home yet. <laughs> and I love that story. We're not home yet. But man, our home is going to be amazing. And the Bible says that God has put eternity into the hearts of every single human being. And what that means is he's, he's instilled within us this reality that some people like to suppress, they want to ignore, but the reality is, is there's more than just this life. There's something beyond this. And people want to ignore that, they want to suppress that, but the truth of the matter is, is 
Eternity is for all of us. And there's only two choices, either eternity with God or eternity separated from God. But the choice is up to you, which one you're going to choose. You place your faith in Jesus and you, you can have that hope that what we're talking about, this is for you. And it even starts today. It starts now because Paul said this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's what happens when you give your life to Jesus, God places you in Christ, in his son. So now when he looks at you, when he sees you, he doesn't see you in your sin anymore, but now he sees you covered in the righteousness of Christ. He sees you in his son, forgiven, and the guilt removed. And so he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Jesus, we get a new start. We get a new heart. We get a new life. And we get a new destiny. Amen?